Hi everyone, I'm Stephen Downs. Welcome back to Ethics, Analytics, and the Duty of Care. We're in Module 5 looking at approaches to ethics, and as you can see on the screen, in this talk we'll be talking about social contracts. And this is a huge area, and to some degree it carries personal meaning for me because I've always lived in a world basically governed by social contracts or what people have called social contracts and I've, I've often pushed back against them. I'm called to, to think of a case recently where I had an interaction on Twitter, doesn't everything start that way, where somebody basically said, you know, corporations stop commenting on my tweets and my response was, oh, who died and made you king? And so the exchange went back and forth. They disapproved of my language. I disapproved of their disapproval and said, basically, I am not governed by what you think are the social conventions. But they said, you know, there is an agreement that what happens on Twitter, at least in small discussion groups, are private. And, you know, it raises the question of what these agreements consist in how they're created, what their applicability is, and what the long-term impact of them is. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll come back to that discussion maybe a bit later in the talk, but you know, this sort of interaction has an effect on me, and I think it has an effect on a lot of people. And so, you know, although we think of social contracts as within the domain of political science or political philosophy, it's their implementation as an ethical principle, I think, that really strikes home to most, most people. So that's what I want to talk about today. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to go through a, a wide range of theories. Too much content, this could be a whole theory, this could be a whole degree program. Um, so I'm going to miss some things, but that can't be avoided. Um, but I hope this gives you a sense of some of the debates and some of the discussions in the field. So what are social contracts? Well, the core idea of a social contract is the idea that ethics, whatever we think it is, somehow results from an agreement within a community. And every word of, of that core idea could be questioned. The major components, at least to my mind, of social contract ethics are, first of all, the process or method by which agreement is reached. Secondly, uh, the determination of what the actual contents are of the resulting agreement. And then third, what the motivation is to abide by the agreement. And we can see that all three of these things are necessary. There needs to be some means of reaching an agreement, whatever it is. And we'll look at two major types. Uh, there needs to be some understanding of the contents of the agreement, but it wouldn't also be ethical unless individuals feel compelled to follow the principles. So, we need all three. Uh, on the diagram there, this is a diagram of the political dimensions of social contracts. But you know, these spill over into ethical dimensions as well. And so we have dimensions of personal liberty and economic liberty co contrasted with economic security and personal or group security. We can draw, you know, the scale between left and right, anarchist and totalitarian, and we could probably draw it along any number of other axes. And I sort of want to caution, before we get too deep into this, that we need to keep the ethical domain and the political domain separate. At least I think we do. I mean, not everybody would agree with that. Some people would say, you know, the the ethic that our govern that governs our society should also be the law that governs our society. 
but but I think that there are good reasons for keeping this discussion separate. And we'll, we'll return to some of those as well as we go through this talk. So I'm going to begin with the concept of mores. Now, mores aren't, strictly speaking, ethical principles, but they give us a sense of where social contractarian ethical principles arise. And they're important to understand uh, both in terms of their genesis and their content. Um, mores are not deliberately invented or thought of or worked out by some people in society. Uh, they're, they're not created or constructed, we might say. Rather, they emerge gradually out of the customary practices of the people, largely without conscious choice or intention. And so in this way, they're similar to folk ways, and they're similar to social norms, but they carry a bit more of an edge to them in the sense that if you violate a more, you will probably be subject to some sort of social sanction. Social mores will cover conventional practices regarding relationships and sex, uh, maybe things like treatment of animals, probably things like honesty, keeping your word, uh, perhaps uh, nonviolence or at least the appropriate use of violence. They tend to be fuzzy and unclear. Uh, their uh, enforcement uh, is not always even-handed. Um, and, you know, it's all a very loose system. But it's also a system that most of us understand. Um, I would not walk out naked in the community, not because it's against the law. Actually, I'm not sure if it is. Uh, but because I'd be violating a more, uh, I'd be violating a community standard of decency if I did that. And that's how mores work. But over time, we see a need for more of a formalization of these and more of a reasoning, you know, to come up with a reasoning behind their development and their implementation. And that's what leads us into social contract theory. We can think of it as arising from situations where, you know, things like mores don't really seem to help us. A classic example is called the prisoner's dilemma. And the way this works is each prisoner is given the opportunity to betray the others. So there are two prisoners, A and B. Um, you can betray the other person or you can stay silent. If you betray the other person, you get off scot-free. Uh, but the other person suffers. <laughs> If you both betray each other, um, you both suffer. But if you both stay silent, you both benefit. Now, the benefit isn't as much as you could get if you betray the other and the other does not betray you. So there's an incentive there to hope that the other person is altruistic and you're not so that you can get off scot-free and let them pay the whole price. But you can see how that breaks down because if you look at the overall benefit, if you're both silent, you both pay a little bit, but not very much. And certainly nothing compared to the result for either one of you or both of you if you betray the other. We see the diagram of, of the calculation here, right? So here we have the um, indicating with the mouse. Here we have the stay silent calculation. Here we have the betrays calculation. And here we have one or the other. So the idea of the prisoner's dilemma is that the rational behavior here is governed not only by what happens to you, but also what happens to your friend. And 
in that calculation, the rational behavior here is to stay silent. But typical ethics, traditional ethics, doesn't seem to work that way. Certainly, something like this would be dramatically underdetermined by a system of social mores. Although I might add, you know, there, there are unwritten spoke, social codes that say, you know, like, you do not betray the other. So, you know, in a, in a sense, a lot of social mores and social customs have addressed this prisoner dilemma. But how do they do it? What is the thinking behind it? Well, what we find is that overall, in the wider scheme of things, though, we haven't solved it. Um, look at pollution, right? Uh, suppose you live in a society that has highly polluting cars, right? You can put a catalytic converter on your car. It's going to cost you money. Um, but although you'll reduce pollution a little bit, it really won't change the overall scheme of things. For it to work, everybody has to do it, which means everybody has to pay a cost. But if nobody wants to pay the cost, nobody will do it, and we end up with really bad pollution. So we need some mechanism of reaching some kind of agreement. We're seeing the similar sort of dilemma playing out on the global stage. We, we just had some recent climate talks, which once again ended up in futility. And the argument is often advanced. Well, why should we do anything to address climate change? Because, you know, probably China and India aren't going to do anything. And so you know, we're paying a cost, but we're not getting any result. And the idea of... The solution to the prisoner's dilemma is you have to take that leap of faith. But it's really hard to reach that leap of faith, you know, without some sort of formal structure, which is why they have these talks. Uh, similarly, with the uh, current pandemic, um, you know, everybody benefits if each of us wears a mask. Wearing a mask is a bit of an inconvenience for each of us. And it really only works if everybody wears a mask. But not everybody wears a mask. So again, we have the same sort of dilemma. So what we need, it is argued, is some kind of system of morality by agreement. And, and typically this expresses itself as an explicit agreement. Social mores will take you a certain distance, but at some point we've got to come to an agreement. Uh, specifically, you know, to, to quote James Rachels from his well-known book, The Elements of Moral Philosophy, uh, morality consists in the set of rules governing how people are to treat each other that rational people will agree to accept for their mutual benefit on the condition that others follow those rules as well. And so you see the different elements here of the solution to the pr prisoner's dilemma. We're going to agree with rules. Uh, it's for our mutual benefit, and the condition is everybody has to follow the rules. You see this come up all the time in society. Uh, you know, unionism. Uh, you know, a unionized workplace is basically this kind of thing. Uh, we will benefit if we bargain collectively in the workplace, but the thing is, everybody has to agree to be bound by the bargaining one way or another. You, you, you can't have some people bargaining and others, as they say, acting as free riders. Okay, so... What's the justification for all of that? Well, we go back to Thomas Hobbes, who didn't actually write in 1986. He wrote, uh, I think it's the 15 or 1600s. And that's a time in Britain where there was significant debate about the role of the monarchy and the role of the barons. Uh, about who should basically control the state. 
Um, and the argument advanced by Thomas Hobbes is that we, and by we, he means people who have their own armies, um, should willingly cede power to the monarch in order to escape the state of nature in which no rules exist and where he says, where, as he says, there are, quote, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. You see the appeal here, right? <clears throat> the consequences to ourselves not ceding power to a monarch are significant. You know, if we're all warring among ourselves, if we all take justice into our own hands, then we're in a state of perpetual conflict. And he argues, this is the natural state, right? This is how things would be if we did not reach this agreement. So we agree to cede the right of executing punishments, enforcing the law, to the monarch. We don't take it into our own hands. And that's what keeps everybody safe. So the appeal here is safety and security. Another approach to creating a social contract was advanced by John Locke, writing around the same time, a little after Thomas Hobbes. And again, Locke depicts the contract as a mechanism of people working together, but instead of protecting us from each other, as Hobbes describes it, in the case of Locke, it's a mechanism to defend the rights of citizens against the sovereign, the king. And in particular, um, to protect their right to property. Uh, Locke had a, Locke's philosophy, political philosophy, is based to a large degree in property. And, and his view of property is that uh, anything that we find in nature and that we add our own labor to, by that very fact becomes our property and we have a right over it. We get to keep it, to sell it, to do what we want with it. And this fundamental right needs to be defended against monarchs who, despite not actually having done any labor themselves, would attempt to seize our property. And you, you can see this reflected in, in a lot of political discussion today where people say, you know, my property, my land is mine, government stay out, stay away, government stay out of it. That's a, the Lockean sort of view. And the way this is enforced is by the creation of the social contract, whereby people work together in order to protect this right to property. And Locke says, basically, if the sovereign violates that, if the state becomes too repressive, then there are two means uh, of remedy. Uh, the one means is to move away. And in John Locke's time, a lot of people did exactly that. And so we have the migration, for example, of, of the Quakers to North America, um, or even the exile of criminals to Australia. Um, and the other way is to take up arms and overthrow the monarch. And, and here we have the idea that the right to, well, take up arms and overthrow the monarch is based on this social contract. We are giving ourselves an agreement that if it comes to that, that's what we'll do. Again, you know, there's this presumption here not so much of the, the, the inherent badness of humans, 
but the inherent badness of monarchs or, or, or power structures or the state generally. And it's the state that we most want to protect ourselves from. And it's interesting to see how much of that is reflected in some societies today, sometimes legitimately. I mean, sometimes there are certainly legitimate reasons to fear the state. Other times, maybe not so much so. So in the 1700s, and we, we reach the Enlightenment and a, a more rationally conceived structure of morality and civilization, we get Jean-Jacques Rousseau writing a number of years before the French Revolution, but no doubt influential on it. And he writes, and I've said this before, man is born free, yet everywhere he is in chains. And here, the oppressor is not each other, and it's not the monarch specifically, but it's society as a whole. And the net effect of society is to con constrain the natural freedom of people and instead to enslave them, to serve the will of the master, whoever that is. And that wasn't, you know, an exaggeration in Rousseau's time. People didn't have individual freedom. And, and in places like, for example, uh, Russia, the idea of freeing the serfs was a real question. Um, and what Rousseau also thought was that the contract, although it's a social contract, the objective isn't simply to protect us from harm from each other or to protect our property, but rather to ascertain what could be called the general will, which would be expressed by the unanimity of citizens. Um, that's a hard concept to put a finger on, although you know this concept of a social will or a general will is going to echo through philosophy since the days of Rousseau. And, and you, you see it in, in Hegel in the phenomenology of right with a world spirit moving through history or even Marx's dialectical materialism. And again, thinking of the will of humanity moving through history, and that's where we get the expression of being on the right side of history, and so on. And Rousseau is, is very careful to caution against putting important functions, like, say, education, into the hands of individuals or into the hands of interest groups, because he says, inevitably, they will turn this power around to work to their own advantage rather than to the advantage of the will of the entire people. So this is a, a representation of Rousseau's theory, but you know it, it contains elements of all theories. And for those of you listening on audio, what I've got up here is a diagram that I grabbed from Pinterest. <laughs> um, but in, this, in the center, we have state and sovereign linked together by laws. And the laws are executed by government, which may be a democracy, may be an aristocracy, may be a monarchy. But the idea here is it's the executive branch, if you will. And these laws are basically declarations of a general will and that general will, will results from a social contact, social contract that people agree to support and obey. So we've got government, state, which is the subject's laws, sovereign, which might be citizens, a will, and then individuals, and then uh, these individuals express their general will through a combination of civil freedom and natural freedom. And we'll come back to the subject of freedom 
Uh, but, you know, without freedom, it's not possible for individuals to express and see implemented their will in the general will. So these tend to be the major components of a social contract model of ethics. And, you know, the, the players can change, but you're going to get the same sort of idea no matter what. You're going to have the will or the, you know, the, the overall values. You're going to have the laws or the principles. You're going to have an enforcement mechanism. You're going to have a deliberation mechanism. And then, you know, the social conditions that make all of this possible. Uh, it's pretty sophisticated and elegant theory of ethics. I mean, there's a lot to recommend it. But there are problems. <laughs> oh, yes, there are problems. One of the most significant problems is enforcement. <coughs> and I would even say that, you know, enforcement sometimes feeds back in on itself. So, you know, if we're looking at political philosophy, you know, we, we jump right into the question of police powers we jump into forms of sanction or punishment. And social contract theory, it may be criticized, uh, gives government too much powers, and I'm quoting here, to make laws under the guise of protecting the public. Specifically, governments may use the cloak of the social contract to invoke the fear of a state of nature to warrant laws that are intrusive. And uh, that's from an open text BC text on social contract theory. And we've seen this play out, haven't we? And, and we've seen more than one politician raise the scepter of anarchy if we don't give the police or the army or whatever enough power to protect us. But the problem is, uh, who protects us from the police? Um, and even even more to the point, um, the the idea of what the protectors want feeds back into what should become law, feeds back into our idea of what is morally right. You know, whatever is good for the police, whatever is good for the military, that's good for society. Supporting these things, therefore, becomes ethically good, or at least a social good on which other ethics may be based. But it can go to extremes. Um, and, you know, I, I go back to that original Twitter debate that I had, which, which was just a Twitter debate, so it doesn't mean anything. But the idea that was being expressed here by the other person was that a there is this expectation of privacy and b this expectation needed to be uh, addressed in tweets addressed to companies in order for it to be enforced but also in order for it to be created in the first place like there wouldn't be this violation of ethics unless people enforced it so it feeds back into itself but you know it comes back down to my first question who died and made them king um you know we we have the idea here that the enforcement mechanism creates the ethics and that's not really what we had in mind when we came up with the social contract second question is to do with has to do with consent generally and David Hume in some withering critiques uh, of, of Hobbes and Locke addresses this head on. Uh, Hume is a contemporary of Rousseau and they knew each other and they were actually friends for a while and then they were frenemies for a while. Um, but Hume has two questions. First of all, Hume questions the adequacy of social contract theory as a historical account. Uh, he says, almost all the governments which exist at present 
or of which there remains any record in story, have been founded originally either on usurpation or conquest, or both, without any pretense of a fair consent or voluntary subjection of the people. Now, since then, there, there have been some exceptions to that, but not very many, and they haven't always worked out well. The second thing he says is, he does, is question the validity of consent claimed by these theories. Because let's face it, right? People can say, yeah, there's a social contract, but none of us signed anything. And if you look at the remedies offered by Locke, those aren't really remedies, are they? Uh, especially the one you know, leave the country. Um, you know, usually leaving the country is not an easy proposition. Um, and Hume says, we may as well assert that a man, by remaining in a vessel, freely consents to the dominion of the master, though he was carried on board while asleep, and must leap into the ocean and perish the moment he leaves her. You know, if the only way to escape a social contract is to jump into the sea and die, that's not really consent. And these, these are pretty important considerations. I mean, absent any actual mechanism of creating a social contract or consenting to it, the, the whole idea of a social contract as a basis for either government or ethics is a bit of a farce. And, you know, it's based on historical circumstance and not one which usually benefits either you or I. So, time goes by. The world looks at other grounds of ethics. Kant comes along not after Hume, gives us the concept of duty. Um, and that's influential for many years. But in the 1970s, liberalism rises again in the voice of John Rawls, who comes up in his monumental book, A Theory of Justice, with a social contract that results in a theory of justice as fairness. And therefore, we can infer of ethics as fairness. So how do we arrive at this? Well, what Rawls does is he sets up a mechanism whereby we can negotiate what we want in society. But it's a hypothetical. It isn't really happening. Um, and it's ahistorical. So we're not saying society was actually founded this way. But had we been in that position, we would have founded it this way. So what he does is he puts everybody into what he calls an original position. So puts us in a hypothetical room. We're all going to sit down and negotiate what government will be. Um, but we need to abstract ourselves from who we actually are. Because, you know, uh, otherwise wealthy people will argue for the interests of the wealthy. Um, uh, powerful people will argue for the interests of the powerful, etc. So what we do, and you can see it in the diagram there, you set up a veil of ignorance. So in this hypothetical situation, we are all arguing from the same stance. We don't know who we will end up being in society. So presumably what that means is we got to take into account all possibilities. We might be the rich person, but we might be the poor person. And so what Rawl says is that what we would come up with in such a, a contract is a set of rules that treats us all as equal. And then as well, a range of basic rights and freedoms for everyone. And then finally mechanisms to ensure prosperity so that there's enough for everyone. Well, 
it's not clear to me that that's what we would choose because it's not clear to me that everybody in the original position is going to be super rational about what they're going to argue for because if we look at actual politics and actual opinion polls uh, people tend to to vote and therefore to argue in terms of their aspirations and and not their actual situation so they vote as if they were a millionaire hoping to be a millionaire someday rather than against the interests of the millionaire now that that critique is a bit different from the critiques that originally surfaced after Rawls but I think it's an important critique anyhow the other thing about Rawls's position is the discussion of fairness again it's a principle of justice as fairness so in both the original position where we have a presumption of it and in the actual society where we have an implementation of it fairness is fundamental and for fairness now i'm going to quote a couple of things from field uh, the fairness principle was defined as equitable and treat and impartial treatment of data subjects by AI systems. We're going back to the ethical codes because fairness is brought up a lot in these codes. And similarly, the principle of equality stands for the idea that people, whether properly or sim whether similarly situated or not, deserve the same opportunities and protections and that kind of gets at our intuitive understanding of fairness right it's something like equality something like equity something like you know it's based on what we do not who we are that sort of thing but some questions um and on, at the bottom of the slide i have three two in text form one in cartoon form one question is is fairness something that can be addressed algorithmically in other words is fairness an actual and real measure of anything and it's not clear to me that it is also we're still faced with you know a different kind of version of the prisoner's dilemma we, we see this argument expressed a lot uh, in uh, the article the problem with too much fairness we read we care so much about fairness that we are willing to sacrifice economic well-being to enforce it so it's kind of almost like reverse prisoner's dilemma right if we were all self-interested that would actually earn us more money than if we try to be fair it's not clear that that's an empirical position that can be sustained with the evidence but it's certainly clear that that's an argument that people raise and then the cartoon freedom says one person isn't as important as fairness and the other person replies who decides what's fair first person says me and yeah that's my definition of fairness i decide what's fair okay that's not my definition of fairness but you see the issue right who decides what's fair how do we decide what's fair and how far do we take fairness if it turns out that fairness doesn't optimize for say consequences the other major element of Rawls theory of justice and indeed of a lot of discussions of ethics and political science over the years is rights and the assertion here is uh, to quote from uh, BC human rights simply by existing in the world you are entitled to certain basic rights your human rights so the first question that comes up what are these rights and the diagram suggests a few 
that show up fairly commonly. Assembly, association, movement, religion, speech, information, freedom of the press, thought, education. But, you know, the, the, none of these rights is absolute. And, uh, you know, especially if we look at them on a global basis, they don't always really exist at all. Um, movement, for example, well, you can't just pack up and leave the country. It's just not an option. Um, education, uh, you know, so many hundreds of millions of people in the world are uneducated. I could go on. And these definitions of rights show up differently depending on who's doing the defining. We have the U.S. Bill of Rights, um, based on a concept of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which we now know is a utilitarian objective. We have the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, based on peace, order, and good government, which makes us think more of a Hobbesian approach. And then the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations, which I would argue is very aspirational. So we have all of these different definitions of rights. And I would argue that, you know, if we get down to it, these, these rights uh, can be extended in numerous ways. People often talk about freedom to and freedom from. So here we have a definition of freedom to, you know, freedom to associate, freedom of the, of the uh, press, freedom of speech, etc., but it's been often pointed out that these freedoms aren't very useful if you're living in poverty. And so there is a corresponding concept of freedom from, right? Freedom from oppression, freedom from want, freedom from poverty, freedom from exploitation. Um, and then some, you know, these rights are changing to just in our sense over time, uh, privacy which was the focus of the Twitter debate, you notice that this doesn't appear, appear in the standard definition of rights. Um, and it's not clear that privacy is a right. Um, similarly, you know, the right to bear arms is, is a right that exists in one country, but not in most others. And I like to sometimes think of rights as, you know, as uh, defining a share, not only of, uh, you know, of political aspirations, but economic aspirations. I would argue, for example, that simply by existing in the world, you are entitled to a share, an equal share, of the wealth of the world. Uh, how does that fly, though? I mean, is that bounded by uh, region? Uh, does my share of the wealth of the world include a share of the wealth of the world as produced in Russia? Um, and how does that respect, say, indigenous rights? Uh, do some people have more of a share of the wealth of certain areas? Uh, do indigenous people have more of a share of the wealth of North America? Um, or And does that mean that my share of the wealth of the world has to come from Ireland, where there are currently Irish people. I mean, we, we get into these debates. Once we start trading debates about rights, it, it's hard to know where to stop. So, what do we do? Well, there's an alternative set of discussions that parallels the discussions of rights. Um, and we can look to the work of people like Michael Polanyi or Friedrich Hayek to distinguish between, and, and we'll be rough and loose here, uh, between constructed orders and naturally occurring or emergent orders. Uh, or, you know, Hayek distinguishes between self-generating order and directed social order. Uh, or you can talk about system of mutual adjustment versus an established corporate order. 
those of you who have followed my career over the years will know that the sort of distinction that we're drawing here is the distinction between uh, a rules-based kind of mechanism and a connectionist kind of mechanism, but without all the technical details. And so we can approach the question of how we generate the social contract in the same way. And all the examples that we've looked at so far are deliberately established corporate orders where the idea is people sit down and draft some kind of contract or agreement. But, you know, we started this talk looking at social mores, and that's not how social mores work at all. Social mores just kind of happen by all, you know, all the little attitude adjustments that we undergo in our interactions with each other. And that's what I think was the problem with the, the Twitter comment, right? The, the idea that by trying to enforce some kind of moral order through Twitter comments, you were trying to set up some kind of deliberately established corporate order. But if there's any ethics of Twitter use, it's going to be one of these self-generating orders. So it's not going to be created by a person saying this is the rule. It's going to occur without any such specification. And indeed, we'll just wait for the train to go by because why not? Speaking of <laughs> imposed social orders, um, you know, uh, there's a contrast between the two, between the, the corporate order and the self-generating order. And, and let's explore that a bit. Um, the self-generating order theory, we'll call it that, um, in, at least in some contexts, has its origin in the economic thought of the Scottish Enlightenment, and especially Adam Smith, who's writing around the same time as Rousseau and Hume, um, all, all part of that same group. Um, and basically the argument here, and we'll, we'll go back to Buchanan and Tillock to, to state it for us, modern social scientists have, like, have tended to neglect the individual decision-making that must be present in the formation of group action in the public sector. So modern social scientists are saying, look, it's not like something has been created and then everyone follows it. Rather, everybody makes their own individual decisions and that's how we get our order. And they reject contract theory of the state as an explanation of either the origin or basis of political power, which in itself was appropriate, but they've tended to overlook the elements within the contractarian tradition that provide us with a bridge between the individual choice calculus and group decisions. And basically, it boils down to this. A group decision is essentially the result of a whole bunch of individual decisions. Expressed in terms of economics, it's the invisible hand of the marketplace. All of the selling and purchasing decisions made by individuals creates the overall economic rationale that we see for macro phenomena such as the cost of things or the price of things. These individual decisions create supply and demand. But it, this happens not just in economics. Uh, you know, the existence, say, of a social sanction against walking outside naked is the result of all of the individual cases, real or hypothetical, where people have walked outside naked and been resisted by members of the community, or even more to the point, 
where people have made these individual choices not to walk out naked. You see how that works, right? And, you know, it's a logic that I've explained in, in other places, um, a logic where uh, you have a network of interacting individuals and then emerging from that is some kind of order, a murmuration of starlings, say. So that's the theory here. Well, how does that work? Well, the problem is it doesn't really address things like, say, market failure. Um, a, a good example of a market failure is scarcity, where if something becomes scarce, um, and the demand for it is inflexible, then the price rises through the roof. And the result is that you get a very unequal distribution. Some people get to eat and other people starve. And we've seen that market failure play out in a variety of ways over the years. Another example of market failure um, is pollution, um, where and there is no mechanism for pricing pollution um, because there's insufficient demand for non-polluting things. And so people can pollute for free, resulting in a market failure and coal clouded skies. And that market failure still exists today, uh, even in places with, with planned economies and planned markets. So Gautier comes along and says, well, look, there needs to be a rational justification, at least for a minimal set of rules, based on a principle of rational self-interest. And so contractarianism is a response to these cases where everyone following those, their self-interest would be harmful to everyone. So it's going back to this original justification for social contract theory based on things like the prisoner's dilemma. And you see this trope over and over again in this discussion. And so the collection or the collective rationale of moral rules basically is a device to secure, quote, the cooperative outcome. Now, people, again, who've listened to me over the years have, have heard me argue that I'm in favor of things like cooperation rather than collaboration. So, and cooperation is far better than everybody just doing their own thing. So, to be rational in this context is to be disposed to act in a way that maximizes the satisfaction of one's interests. So you're still being self-interested. It's an enlightened self-interest and it leads you to enter in to a contract with others, not necessarily to work for the same end, but to cooperate in such a way that, you know, a rising tide floats all boats. And that's the idea here. And again, you've, you've certainly heard about this. And that almost invariably means giving up some of your own self-interest um, in order to produce the wider gain for everyone. Uh, now, you can see why this is necessary. Um, here we have, from Garrett Hardin, the tragedy of the commons, where people are maximizing their own self-interest. Um, so, the idea here is that rational individual decision making will harm resources held in common. So we have a common pool of water and the water table under the ground. So nobody owns it, so you can just take as much as you want. But the result, talk to California, is the water table gets lower and lower and lower. The thing is, there's, there's two different responses to that. And the typical response to that is to say, well, okay, uh, that just proves that the water should be owned by somebody who would have 
a self-interest to take care of it. And here we have John Locke again, right? Um, we'll, we'll make it property. Uh, we'll give people guarantees of security over their property and that'll solve the problem, right? They'll own the water, they'll sell it to everyone else. But we know that that doesn't work because the person who has the water has an incentive to sell it and sell it and sell it until it runs out. And in fact, as it runs out, they can keep raising the price. And they've created, in fact, a situation of scarcity and exactly the sort of chaos that this was supposed to prevent. Um, so the other side of that is, okay, we should have a system of rules and regulations in order to manage the water. And that's an approach a lot of governments have taken. But again, uh, the question comes up, uh, could a government manage the water table any better than an individual? Because a government has an incentive to give out and give out, give out more and more water until the water table runs low. And we saw that happen in the case of the Canadian fisheries, where government after government after government refused to lower the, the rate at which fish could be caught with the result a number of years ago that the Atlantic cod fishery, for example, basically ended. And it's not the first of those sorts of cases and not the last of those sorts of cases. So there needs to be a mechanism to reach some sort of a, an agreement. It needs to be a rational mechanism such that it won't result in the draining of all the water or the catching of all the fish, which means it's got to protect against self-serving interests on either the part of government or on the part of individual property holders. It should, as Rousseau would say, represent the general will. The problem is the invisible hand of the marketplace might not, arguably will not, produce that kind of result. That's not the only problem with social contract theory. That's just one of them. Another problem, and this comes from Marcia Nussbaum, is that social contract tradition, especially in its Rawlsian form, cannot give justice to disabled people. More, it cannot supply global, global justice beyond the nation state. And more, it cannot render justice to animals. And this all has to do with how we've set this up originally. Um, the decision makers in the original position, well, first of all, they're all human. Animals can't be represented here because animals aren't capable of negotiating a satisfactory outcome. Um, and it goes well beyond the scope of Rawls's theory to have some people imagine that they're animals or at least imagine the possibility that in society they might be animals. Um, now, and that's a bit difficult to accept at face value because most of us have the capacity to imagine we are an animal or at least to emphasize with the condition of an animal. And, you know, I, I could prove that pretty simply by bringing in a cat here and torturing it. Now, I'm not going to do that, nor would I actually seriously contemplate doing that. But any reaction that you had negative to what I just said is evidence that, yeah, we can imagine. Similarly, and by inference, we're not really able to put ourselves in the position of the disabled, at least not unless we are actually disabled. Um, because we, we can't imagine the barriers that they face. And this is true whether they're in a wheelchair or whether they're blind or whether they're cognitively disabled. Uh, you know, we're just not able to conceive of what their rights and interests and needs would be. And then it, in the case of global social contracts, we're just not in a position to care one way or another about the result of the contract. 
Um, you know, we can imagine that we will live everywhere or anywhere, but we're not really imagining that we're living in Kurdistan, really. Um, so for the unique conditions of, of the Kurds, we're not able to bring those into our calculations. You know, and, and ethics and morality only goes so far, right? We're, we're only s concerned about, you know, at least our immediate area or perhaps our immediate country. But we don't really project ethics, you know, around the world to, to other nations and other states. And perhaps neither should we. So we need something else, and Nussbaum is interested, and here I quote uh, from an article, in how a view that finds human dignity expressed in a variety of life activities, I've given some examples, translate into demands of justice. It's not going to be produced through a social contract. And indeed, it points to what we might call the fragility of goodness. Um, here's Nussbaum again. More people and more beings deserve justice than those who make the rules. Just because you aren't self-reflective doesn't mean you don't have a dignity that demands respect. There is more to life than profiting off each other for human beings, fellowship, and compassion are ends in themselves too. And it's hard to see how any of that, uh, self-dignity, respect, fellowship, compassion, we could add a number of other things, is going to work its way into a social contract. Um, the privacy of a public chat on Twitter can't imagine seeing that come up. I can't imagine that being decided one way or another because it just really has nothing to do with rights, fairness, or anything else as we currently conceive them. And yet there's an ethical dimension here. You know, and that's the thing about contracts. Um, contracts and the concept of contracts presumes something like radical individualism and self-interest. Now, I know corporations can make contracts, but in order for that to happen, we have to think of corporations as individuals or even corporations as persons acting in their own rational self-interest. And indeed, persons with a fiduciary duty to act in their own rational self-interest. But there are issues with this idea of radical individualism and self-interest. First of all, we can't all be self-sufficient. And we, we, you know, and we can't even imagine a world in which we are all self-sufficient. In fact, it is arguable, and I would argue, nobody is self-sufficient. Um, and, and also, we have preferential attachments. We can't treat the rest of the world equally. Um, I treat the people in the next room far more preferentially than I treat people in the next country, much less people around the world. And many people would argue that's the way it should be. You know, family first. Um, also, contract theory presumes that the only obligations we have are those that are freely chosen, um, which allows for the objection that, well, then I don't freely choose any obligations. Um, or there are some obligations I can't choose. It's just not, I'm not capable of it. So we need some way of imagining how non-punitively, presumably, we deal with people who are living outside the contract. And again, they can't just pack up and move away. The, the, the slogan, you know, love it or leave it, is not a practical option. Particularly if it's somewhere where you were born. 
right? Uh, you know, I, being born Canadian, I'm just, it's not an option for me to leave Canada and go live somewhere else if I don't like the way we do ethics here in Canada. And yet, being in Canada, there's no way really for me to live outside the socially constructed ethical framework that we find ourselves in. And there's no way to change it either. These are issues. Uh, we have this idea of individualism Maybe we can just think of it as theoretical or, or as Buchanan and Tullock say, methodological individualism. And, and the way we'll think of it is that human beings are conceived as the only ultimate choice makers in determining group as well as private action. So how is a corporation going to decide? Well, think about the individual running the corporation is making that decision. Um, and we've looked at this quite closely. Well, economists have looked at this quite closely. Just how individuals make decisions in what we sometimes call the market sector with corporations, companies, and all of that. And there's, there's, there's a, it's a huge field of study. And it's pretty easy to be cynical about that field of study. You know, I, I call it market rationalization with the emphasis on the word rationalization. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to make unethical decisions when you're acting on behalf of a corporation instead of on behalf as an, of an individual instead of for yourself. And in fact, the whole mechanism of incorporation and, and corporate bankruptcy allows people to avoid responsibility for the decisions that they make uh, for their corporation. That's the whole point, right? And although some people have said in this course uh, that you know uh, there should be an ethic of uh, allowing corporations to die or actually killing corporations, and I certainly see the justification for that, but in an important sense, that's to punish the wrong party, at least on this analysis, because the person who made the decision wasn't the corporation, it was actually the CEO. And that's why sometimes in Canadian law, we had a case recently where uh, the company was allowed to avoid legal liability that would have essentially ended the company because it agreed to remove all of the people who made the decision from the company and sort of wiping that slate clean allows the company to survive but it still doesn't really punish the decision makers does it there's also you know a, a cultural calculus of consent which is a little bit different uh, from the calculus of consent that Buchanan and Tullock talk about in corporations and this is a way of depicting the way cultures decide things. And it's a relation between power, faith, fate, gender, health, illness, relationships, etc. Again, though, uh, you know, do we distinguish the individuals in a culture who make a decision in the name of a culture? from the culture itself and that's not a tr that's a non-trivial question uh, particularly as we move on through these next few considerations here uh, the idea of a non-individualist sort of ethic is captured in the idea of collectivism and in their book, Individualism and Collectivism, Harry Huey and Harry Triandis talk about collectivism as incorporating concern, where this means concern for the impact of one's actions on other people, sharing of mutual or material and non-material resources, including cultural resources. But collectivism also includes 
susceptibility to social influence, think for example of peer pressure, uh, self-presentation and face work, that you know, the, the, the face that you have, the way you face the world, not makeup, although it can include makeup, uh, are, are factors. Where there's a sharing of outcomes, and here a good way to think of it is collective responsibility or the corollary collective punishment. But you know, it, it, but it's also you know a father taking pride in the son's accomplishments, or, or one brother feeling guilty about the actions of another brother, um, and then the feeling of involvement in other people's lives. You know, you, you don't live as a single individual; you are actually a part of this larger social organization, the collective, and. It's this collective that generates ethical roles and responsibilities rather than, say, rational, individualistic decision-making. Um, and there's a range of theories based on the idea of creating ethics collectively. And this is what my Twitter opponent was appealing to, right? He was saying, basically, there is this collective ethos of privacy that has developed over time on Twitter, and that's the ethics that's being violated. Also, there's an ethic of polite conversation, and you're also violating, violating that, he continued. Uh, and, you know, there, there are some questions to ask here, right? Um, how do we know that that's the collective ethic of Twitter and how do we know that I've violated it and what's the sanction for it? Well, part of the story comes from Finnamore and Sicklink, Sick, Sickink in the life stages or the life cycle of a norm. We, and think about how this works. There's the norm emergence where, quote, norm entrepreneurs seek to persuade each other. And then there's the norm cascade where gradually there's a tipping point and then norm internalization where it's just taken for granted. You can see this play out um, in social communities online. I'm a, a devotee of a website called Imgur, I-M-G-U-R. And trust me, there are, you know, we see this process. There are norms on Imgur, Imgur, I don't know. Um, that kind of defy explanations. For example, uh, Imgur is a, a photo or image sharing site, and it also includes short videos. So, and what, then the way it works is there's a thing called user sub, where anybody who's a user of Imgur submits an image, and then you can look at all those images as they're sub submitted. And then you can vote them up or vote them down. And when they're voted up, when they get popular enough, then they, they end up on the most popular page. And that's the page that people usually see when they go to Imgur. So, what are, so basically ethics basically consist in the rules, quote unquote, because it's not written really, uh, of voting up. So one of the rules is uh, no selfies except on Christmas, or for cosplay, uh, which includes Halloween. <laughs> um, but there are exceptions to this, um, you know, like uh, late wa late weight loss photos would be an example of that. It's not actually written down anywhere, but every once in a while someone will come along and say, remember the rule of no selfies, but hardly anyone ever says that. Um, you know, um, other rules, Wednesdays are for Wednesday Adam. Uh, there's um, Catter Day. On, on Super Bowl Day, uh, Imgur is filled with owls, or superb owls, uh, and so on. There's a whole range of these things. Um, so they're kind of an ethic of the website, but it's not really ethics. Although there is a sanction, you won't get voted up if you violate them. Although sometimes people vote them up anyways. So 
There is a sense in which ethics can be created collectively, but it's less clear that there's a sense that people argue about these rationally through debates and impositions of sanctions through Twitter posts or whatever. Um, you know, you can't argue your way to an ethic on a social network site. It just doesn't work. You can't bully your way to an ethic on a social network site. Again, it doesn't work. Um, and so the question is, just what is that process that's happening when an ethic appears on a social network site? And we sort of want to assume that the community somehow collectively decides, but that very often is accompanied by a statement that, you know, and here is what they decided, let me tell you. And that's when it becomes problematic, at least for me. And the same is true more widely, right? People talk about community values. Um, again, nobody's sitting and writing down what the community values are, but somebody's always willing to come along and say, uh, there are community values and here's what they are, let me tell you. And that's a problem. Um, there is a whole set of communitarian ethics and communitarian ethical theory. Uh, people like Michael Sandel and Charles Taylor have responded against the individualistic conception of self um, in Rawlsian social contract and you know we, we can allow for an ethic of individual decision making but at the same time need to understand that what constitutes a self uh, also includes that social background or that cultural background in which the life choices gain importance and meaning. Um, you know, a, a student responding to social pressure in a public school has a very different realization of self than a student responding to social pressure at home school. It's just different. And these differences in culture result in differences in self. So to follow a rule, um, involves this cultural or social self and not just a rational individualist self. Or in other words, ethics are, because of these cultural components of ourselves, in an important sense, non-rational. Um, you know, there isn't a calculation that's coming out the other side. Leads us to the, the ethic of Ubuntu um, or, you know, we, we could talk about it as Ubu Untu. Um, and this is based on uh, the measure of one's relationality with others and with the en environment and all interdependent parts. It is a recognition, again, that there is no self-sufficient person. That each person is inherently the product of and related to everything around them. And so the perceived infallibility and supremacy of rationality in traditional social contract theory, especially as administered through machines, as we see in artificial intelligence, exacerbates marginalization. Uh, it forces us to neglect or ignore or to push away those relations or the impact of those relations that are non-rational or can't be calculated to add to our personal or collective happiness or benefit. And we could talk about all the different ways in which these relationships exacerbate marginalization. Um, you know, from the treatment of indigenous people in the uh, settlement and development of countries such as Canada and Australia, to the marginalization of old people who will no longer offer 
you know, contributions to society or innovation or productivity, um, to the treatment of animals, to a lack of respect for the environment and a view of our relation with the environment as exploitative. You know, all, all of these things fail to recognize the interdependence. You know, and it's funny, I, I once read a science fiction story where, long story short, there's a disease that threatens humanity. Everyone's going to die. But they find the solution to that disease in the genetic makeup of a homeless person who's on the verge of death. And the argument advanced in the scientific story is that uh, we are all collectively the holders of our genetics. Um, you know, the human genetics isn't held in one individual person, but it's held across all of us. And the important piece of genetic material might be in any one of us. And we see a similar argument raised with respect to the rainforest and the huge diversity of life in the rainforest that is in danger of being lost and the potential for medical treatments to be found in this rainforest. And our dependence on that, uh, you know, making the, you know, intertwining the fate of the main forest and the fate of ourselves. And that might sound overly consequentialist, and it is kind of consequentialist. And it's kind of um, uh, transactional. But at the same time, if there is a connection between who we are and what the rainforest is, um, then there's a connection between our ethics vis-a-vis -vis ourselves and our ethics vis-a-vis -vis the rainforest. We, we can see that connection, and that connection has to inform ethical thinking. And it takes us into the realm of Peter Singer and the idea that, uh, you know, when we talk about rights, humans have rights, animals have rights, uh, our descendants have rights, nature has rights, um, you know, we have to think of all of these as intertwined and interconnected. And you can't give rights to one uh, while at the same time oppressing the rights of the others. Well, it sounds great, but there are criticisms because, of course, there are criticisms. Um, one of the criticisms of Ubuntu is that, uh, particularly with respect to cultural rights, um, it entrenches some of the existing and unchallenged discriminatory practices that are based on age, gender, and social standing. And I have an image on the slide here. It's a scene from Tracks, which is an Australian movie that I like a lot, uh, about a woman who uh, takes some camels and crosses the Australian outback, and in so doing, she has to interact with Aboriginal peoples and Aboriginal cultures. And that forms a theme of the movie. Well, one of the one of the expressions in the movie is that women do not handle the knife. She was about to cut uh, an animal that she had caught for food, and then realized, no, women do not handle the knife. And the movie doesn't say this, but that managed to save her from being poisoned because the animal had been poisoned. Um, so you can see the, the reasoning for it. But at the same time, you, you can feel the tension, right, um, of having to accept that there is a rule here that says that, that I, as a woman, cannot handle a knife. That doesn't seem really right. Again, with Ubuntu, it enforces group solidarity at the expense of individual well-being. There's no end to the numbers of examples of that. You know, this sort of concern was the origin for my original groups versus network range of arguments that I began in 2004 and continued since. Uh, it tends to enforce conformity and tends to enforce groupthink. Um, you know, we all have to have these same values, these same ethical principles. When we are part of a group, 
the way we think is the way the group thinks, typically. I mean, not necessarily, but there are problems with that. And, you know, in, in uh, the discussion, like James Schwicky's uh, The Wisdom of Crowds, uh, pointing to the dangers of groupthink and not allowing for independent thought and independent points of view, even in group interactions. And then finally, it reinforces and perpetuates existing imbalances in power relations. Um, for example, uh, think of indigenous people in Canada and whether it's ethically right to run a pipeline through their lands. Um, now, there are all kinds of ways we could decide on this, but one way we could decide on this is fairly straightforward. Do the indigenous people want us to run a pipeline through their lands? Well, here's the problem. Uh, the band councils that are elected say yes. The elders that who are hereditary say no. Um, how do you decide? Uh, if we follow the principle of Ubuntu in this case, well then um, we, we have to take what the elders say seriously because they achieved their position as a result of long-standing um, tradition and ethics in these, uh, in these nations. Um, and so we have to respect that. But it's really hard, you know, coming from an outside perspective to, to accept that somebody who does not respect, you know, the, the will of the entire community can speak on behalf of the community. On the other hand, uh, these democratic band councils are something that was imposed on these nations by... Um, by the white Western government. Uh, there was the requirement that band councils be operated democratically. Uh, and that's considered as a condition for self-governance. No easy answers here. And there seriously aren't easy answers here. Um, you know, I would think, you know, ethics also benefiting from discretion and just plain niceness uh, you wouldn't ram a pipeline through their land if a significant representative, whether or not democratically elected, said, no, please don't do this. Um, but, you know, not everybody is governed by that principle. Other people derive their ethics from other principles. Um, and that forces them to argue for putting the pipeline through. These are hard questions. I don't think social contracts answer these questions. Whether we define social contract as something that we negotiate or hypothetically negotiate or come up with as a principle of each person's individual actions as in an invisible hand or as defined as community or socially determined values. I don't think any of those stories gives us satisfactory answers to the questions that we come up with uh, when we're looking at specific ethical dilemmas. And that's a problem. And it's especially a problem because I've run out of ethical theories. Looked at ethics as virtue, looked at ethics as duty, looked at ethics as determined by consequences, and looked at ethics by agreement and there are significant gaping holes in all of these theories. So in the next video I'm going to look a little bit at meta-ethics, how we talk about these theories, how we arrive at them generally, and then finally I'll look at... Excuse me, that tells me I should be finishing this video. We'll be looking at the end of ethics or where do we go from here. So I hope you look. I hope you enjoyed this uh, romp through social contract and ethics. Again, I've left out far more than I've included here, but the purpose, as usual, isn't to give you a bunch of stuff to remember. 
the purpose is to have you thinking about these issues along with me as I work through them and perhaps coming up with new ideas or new thoughts or new ways of looking at some of these issues that you may then you may have had in the past. So that's it for now. My voice is going hoarse. Again, another sign I've been going too long. Thanks a lot. I'm Stephen Guns. <coughs> Mm-hmm. <clears throat>